Well, hello there, motherfuckers, and welcome to your Raw review. You know, this is another show, victim of a bad format. There's something here on this show I'm going to get to where they should have left it for the end, like an awkwardly put together show. And this is not the first time I've seen a show like this. Um, you know, I'm remembering when we had, you know, Lesnar and Strowman last time. It, you know, we had an awkwardly put together show and they, they did it again. They did it again with Braun Strowman and Lesnar and Kane on this show. So and it's not like the rest of this show was any good. It's more of the same shit. Um, and let's just get right into it. We start off with Roman Reigns cutting a promo. Jason Jordan interrupts. Um, he's stealing Roman Reigns' moment. Um, you know, he's he's gloating about Samoa Joe. And Jason Jordan says they have a common enemy in Samoa Joe. So he comes in. He starts, you know, I like the character that they're giving to Jason Jordan. It's like almost like he's oblivious in the way um, that he's self-centered, that he's coming out there. He he wants to be like the replacement for Ambrose. He says that they're the best three-man team. Rollins comes out. He criticizes him for interrupting the moment. And then my worst nightmare comes true as fuckboy comes out with the best things since sliced bread, with the, the fucking Bullet Club, now the, the Balor Club. So now it's, you know, it, it, it's it's not the club, it's not the Bullet Club, it's the Balor Club. It's a club that I would not want to have anything to do with personally. So Balor comes out there totally not looking like a star, looking like a total geek, um, saying, oh, are they, you really think you're the best three-man team and you know, it's like most people are not going to know about their exploits in Japan. He's saying they're, they were together for 10 years. Um, they're watching each other's back. Okay, I'll give them credit. They're giving these guys something to do on the show. But, um, you know, like why is it any different? They paired them up. With, they paired them up with AJ. Now they're paired up with Balor. It's, it's pretty clear that this is a team that they don't know what to do with. And it's a bit confusing to me. You know, obviously these guys showed they're good on the mic. I'm not really digging the whole Luke Gallows thing with the nerd. I think that's a retarded fucking catchphrase that they really need to get rid of. I mean, that's that's not a good catchphrase. Nobody's laughing at it. Uh, but, you know, you got Luke Gallows, who's this big guy. He's 6'8". Um, and even... Even Carl Anderson made <laughs> Balor look like a tiny motherfucker compared to him. And I don't even think Carl Anderson is really that big of a guy, but it, it showed just how small Balor is in comparison. So, you know, I wasn't really buying this whole thing once again with Balor and Roman Reigns in the same ring. And all the smarks here in the YWC are going to remind me that it was indeed Balor who beat Roman in 2016. And that's when my mind started to change about Roman Reigns, when I started to see how truly pathetic it was that they actually wanted us to believe that Balor not only could be in the same ring as Roman Reigns, but actually beat him fair and square. And any person who thought that that looked good, I feel really sorry for you because that is that did not look good. This did not look good. They did not look like they were the same caliber. Now, Seth Rollins, on the other hand, like I said, I have mixed feelings about that guy. Talented, doesn't look like a star, dangerous in the ring. We all know the, the, the whole thing. I don't have to go through it about Rollins. But Jason Jordan and Roman Reigns look like big stars. The other side of the ring looked like jobbers. Luke Gallows has got the size. He's got a sort of a look to him. But after seeing him for the past couple of years, what they've been doing with the guy, uh, it hasn't been pretty. So I can't really, you know, think about this. Those guys have been with the company for a good two years already. And they haven't amounted to anything at all. I mean, you know, they gave them the tag belts, gave them a win over the Hardys, and it really hasn't amounted to anything really at all. I mean, so now they, they shove them in the Balor Club. This is the funny thing. Balor's, you know, they've had T-shirts of the Balor Club. 
They've had, you know, they talk about the Balor Club. He said the fans are in the Balor Club. Now we actually see the Balor Club. What the hell is even this club already? It, you know, now it's a, a different uh, iteration of it. They can't even make up their minds what they want. So this is what we're getting. We're getting like a fake NWO. We're getting a second rate um, Japanese NWO. You know, they're trying to please the Smarks. They're trying to please the YWC by giving them any semblance of New Japan. And I'm getting pretty sick and tired of it already. We have enough New Japan uh, references. You know, we already have Asuka. We already have Naka Murphy. It's enough already. When are we going to concentrate on actually improving this product instead of catering to the YWC, instead of catering to these... Japanese fans, they already have uh, access to watching the Japanese wrestling. They could go on Access TV. They could go here on YouTube and look it up. There's no need to infuse New Japan and please all these fans because, you know, uh, 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 the audience that is left, the, the, the stragglers, the people that still watch this shit, okay, they might know New Japan. But there's still a segment of the audience who watches my videos who doesn't know a lot about New Japan. Or they, they might know of these people, but they have no interest in them. So now, you know, you've got the um, the non-Japanese uh, people from Japan. And they're trying to do every single little reference they can. Whether it's writing Japanese letters on the AJ Styles jacket or wh wh whatever it is. I'm getting... A, uh, pretty sick and tired of it. This isn't Japan. This is the U.S. This is the WWE. They can't keep on doing all these little references and it's flying over everybody's head. It looks ridiculous already. Decide what company you want to be. At this point, they might as well convert the whole entire thing in, 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 into a Japanese promotion. Get rid of all the other American wrestlers Get rid of everybody from the UK. Get rid of every other single nationality and just replace do shows from move the whole operation out of Connecticut and move it to Japan for fuck's sakes because that's all we're getting week after week. How can we make this show more Japanese? How could we do more New Japan references to please the fans? And you know, I'm not being pleased by this. I'm not being entertained. And seriously. You know, fuck boy, they had the, the right idea with him getting squashed by Gain. They, I thought they woke up and realized that he doesn't belong. The, the next thing I know, he's in the ring with Roman Reigns once again. What is this company even doing? You know, one minute they want to treat this guy as a champion. The next minute they treat him, you know, like he's supposed to. You know, he's he's nothing. And then all of a sudden they get the big idea that, you know, he's a big star again. <laughs> you know, make up your mind what you want to do with your talent. Because uh, now nobody is going to buy him as a star. Maybe when you first introduced him, you know, I was like, okay, this company is going in a new direction. They're trying to, you know, uh, cater to the internet fans. We, we, we've we've lost WWE, we've lost McMahon, you know, he's going the other way. Then it started to go back the other way. We saw a little bit of um, a glimmer of hope. But now that glimmer, once again, is, you know, going back down the tunnel. The, the, the light is getting further and further away from us. And that's pretty fucking sad. So I guess 2018 is going to be about the Balor Club. Good God, are they really going to have this guy at Mania? I, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit scared to see what they have planned, but hopefully it doesn't even go over that well. Um, Sasha Banks and Bailey defeated Absolution. You know, they bring this team in. They want to make them dominant. And it seems like every other week they lose a match, you know, or, or they get beat up or they run away. And now this is the same old six-man tag match that we saw the past two weeks, except now they subtracted two girls away and put them at ringside. <laughs> what a novel idea, right? You know, just uh, let, let, let's have the same exact match, but just have less participants.
And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, you know, what, how the hell are they even going to have a Royal Rumble? Who, who, where's the 30 women going to come from? I mean, I'm not sure if they had, they had announced that it's 30, but obviously it is 30. So, I mean, they're going to get girls coming in from NXT. Um, we heard that Kurt Angle was, I'll get to this a little bit later. He teased that somebody is going to come, somebody who hasn't been in the ring for years. Well, you're going to have to get more than just one legend. You're going to have to get several. Because really, like, you're going to put all these girls where three quarters of them are not even that great. You're going to put them in the ring and then you're just going to bring in a bunch of NXT nobodies that no one's even heard of. I, I, I mean, who are we going to get? Ember Moon? Who the fuck is that? I, you know, I mean, really, wh who are they going to get for this Royal Rumble that a anybody's going to give a damn about, basically? You know, I don't want to hear, oh, you know, you're just not educated on NXT. And, you know, I don't care. I look at the roster in NXT and I see a bunch of girls that are, like, trying to be like Sasha Banks. And try. there's the other Japanese girl that's trying to be like Asuka. Uh, you know, somebody wrote me a while back uh, in the comments about that, that there's, you know, they agree with me about Asuka. But, oh, no, the other Japanese girl is... Is good, I, you know. I don't know. I don't care. But I'm not excited to see this new talent because I don't need to see it. I already know based on who they brought up from NXT the past couple of months. The only one who has any glimmer of hope that that I agree with them being there is Bobby Roode. That's about it. I mean, I, I you know, I, I, at least like I was gonna say, if you're gonna bring somebody up, at least bring up Eric Young who's proved that he could be entertaining in NX, uh, in TNA. So why not bring that guy there instead of bringing a bunch of jobber women that no one even cares about or who has heard of? And there's no problem. You know, at, at, at one point in time, nobody ever heard of The Rock. Nobody ever heard of Stone Cold. Nobody ever heard of Trish Stratus. They burst on the scene and everybody said, who the hell is that? But then they quickly gave you a reason why you should, you know, be interested and keep watching these people. We get things like Absolution, and I'm still wondering, did did Paige really return? To, I mean, did you ever sit there and you're like, Paige returned, and this was supposed to be a big thing. She got a big reaction. She came out. And now I feel like we're just settling into just the normal formulaic approach to a show. Oh, let's have matches. Oh, let's have little promos that are insignificant. You know, this girl returned after, like, you know, huge events, sex tape, a very public relationship with Alberto Del Rio on the Internet. You had all these possibilities. You know, Paige could have been, like, this controversial figure. And then they settle on the most elementary, boring, contrived, and just, you know... Just, it's boring. It is. She's not, like, doing anything on the show of any significance. Okay, you want to make her team take over the women's division? They're not really taking over if they're losing every other week. You know, they win one, they lose one. That You're not establishing a team that way. And it's not enough. I mean, they, they had the right idea when they first came in doing the backstage um, beatdowns. But that only lasted. They should have kept doing that. They should have kept doing that until they had the whole women's division at their knees. But somehow, some way, this simple YouTuber could come up with better ideas just by standing here and, uh, you know, shooting them off the top of his head. I mean, really, a five-year-old, a five-year-old with his wrestling figures could come up with better storylines. You know, people with 2K18 could come up with better, more interesting uh, storylines with better twists. Hell, you know, even the Smarks have better ideas. I I, I mean, you know, well, uh, I won't go that far. I've, I've listened to, you know, Adam uh, Blimpede uh, booking. And, and oof, sheesh. That, let me just say, thank God that WWE doesn't listen to that guy. Uh, because that right there, if they listened to any of his ideas, that'd be a fucking nightmare. I'll tell you something. What what culture has 
some of the worst ideas I've ever heard in my life. Um, and thank God that Adam guy is gone. Simon is 10 times better on what culture, but even he gets a little too smarky sometimes, I will admit. Uh, Goldust was backstage with a little pep talk to Cedric Alexander. I will say this was a bit entertaining. I don't know why they don't utilize Goldust more. I mean, here you have a guy who's established. The, f the fans mostly like him, um, and they're entertained by him. So why not actually do something with this guy? You know, it, it really has been a while since they've done something significant with Goldust. I mean, the last time they did anything with him was, um, you know, when, when you had Cody and, and him teaming together. And, you know, then they just completely squashed that. They did the ridiculous Stardust thing. And then after that, it faded away. Then they had some interesting stuff that he was going to have a protege, but they just, you know, they never continued on with that. It was one of the many storylines that they completely abandoned. So, you know, I, I don't know, you know, they keep him around. Uh, they're, I guess they're trying to make it so he could get Cedric Alexander over. But this is, it's pretty clear. Cedric Alexander has like been in this company now for what, like a year already? Is it fair to say? If he has not gotten himself over by now, what all the TV time they give to him, I, I mean, it's it's obvious. The guy has no charisma. He has a dangerous finishing move. This is all we know about him. You, you know, the, okay, so Goldust is here trying to get him over. Why is Goldust not just off doing his own thing? You know, the segment here is Goldust being entertaining. It's not helping to get Cedric Alexander over because his reaction is boring. He's not doing anything with the opportunity here. You know, it, it was one thing, Goldust doing this comedy and playing off of Booker T. You know, the, uh, granted, Booker T was already an established star that was good on the mic and could be entertaining in his own right. But, you know, what what is this? How is this benefiting? You ever just sit there and say that? What what are they trying to do in this segment? Goldust is there, obviously. They're hoping that, you know, Cedric Alexander will pick up on a little something, but no, you're it's a false hope there because you know that he could not get over with any help because some people are as dry as a desert when it comes to charisma. And this is one of them. This is definitely a guy that is not going to get over. It doesn't matter how many times you put him on screen. Uh, Matt Hardy defeated Kurt Hawkins. I like his new theme music. I got to say they, they did a pretty good job with that. Um, you know, that's one thing that WWE does. You know, they, they know how to write good. Still, if it might be CFO, they still do a decent enough job. Maybe Jim Johnson was better, but, you know, it, it's a decent theme. It fits his character. So he came out. He destroyed uh, Hawkins. He was entertaining during the match. You know, he shouted, it's over, before hitting the twist of fate. So nice little touches there, separating normal Matt Hardy from broken Matt Hardy. Um, then Bray Wyatt appeared in the ring. They stood face to face and laughed at each other. Yes, it's, it's a repeat of what they did weeks ago, but at least they're face to face this time. But the thing is, what I had a problem with here is, you're really going to tell me they're going to stand face to face that close together and they hate each other that much? And they're not going to come to blows. I, I mean, honestly, here, are, are, are we really, it just, it, it fades to black and that's it. And we don't hear from these characters at all. Not, not for the rest of the show. You know, I'm just saying like, you know, suspension of disbelief. But like I said, this, this show really takes suspension of disbelief to a whole new level. They don't want to do anything that even remotely resembles realism. It's, you know, like, it, just to give you an example, you think about Macho Man and Hulk Hogan, uh, you know, backstage. Remember when Macho Man pushed down Elizabeth and everything? You had more realism in the fucking 80s than you do now in, in, in the 2000s. In, in 2018, there's less realism than there was in the 80s when people would argue that the product 
was even more cartoonish with more colorful outfits and shit. And you're you're gonna tell me that they're actually less realistic than that time, and it's true. It really is. Uh, Elias introduced the Miz, and this I was disappointed with this segment. The Miz comes back after two or three months out shooting the movie, and you know it's just a it's a boring promo. He's talking about recapturing the Intercontinental Title. Again, you know, it's again with the inner kind. I don't get what it is with the Miz. It's as hard as this guy works on his promos, they do not want to put him back in the world title picture, no matter what. He is like endlessly chasing the inner continental title. It's it's like how many times is he going to win it? And didn't he already break some sort of record already? You know, he already held the title for a year. Now they, they he's saying he's going to be the longest reigning. I, I don't even... Didn't he surpass the Honky Tonk Man? I thought he did. Apparently not. But, you know, the, he's ba back at it again. I want to win the... Inter it's the same exact time as the last time he lost the Intercontinental title. It's, the, his character is not moving forward. He's not doing anything. He's performing well like he always does on the mic, but it's like they don't want to reward anybody for working hard. So you, you've got a guy like Fuckboy who already proved that he's not over, that people don't feel like doing the hmm during the entrance anymore. He already proved that he's, you know, he's just no good, basically. Reward people like that, right? Give them a main event, put them in a faction, Put him in the ring with Roman Reigns, make him look like a star. But but the Miz, no, he's just good enough for the Intercontinental title, you know. And he's, it's like you you don't want to do anything differently with this guy to set the parts. 2018, and he's still ch he's been chasing the Intercontinental title now for a, for a good five years, for like five years already. I mean, you know, how many times has he won this belt? How many times is he going to win it? And it's always, if he's such a high caliber star, he's the Hollywood guy, but why would he settle for second best? The Miz thinks in his mind that he is the best. So wouldn't it logically make sense that he'd go after the world title? Especially when we already know they tell us how he's a former world champion. Stop with this shit. The Intercontinental title is not on the same level as the Universal Championship. And if it is, then there's no reason to have both belts then. I, I mean, this was never a problem before. I mean, this is even one of the reasons why they eliminated the Intercontinental title at one point. To make the world title seem even more elusive and more important. And they brought it back, but, you know, they, they always kept in mind that that belt is secondary to the world title. Somehow, The Miz doesn't see this. It's it just, it's not consistent with his character. Why would somebody settle on this goal for this many years, especially when they've already tasted the world title? They had Bo Dallas and Curtis Axel arguing, you know, uh, they were taking off their jackets, their watches, and giving him gifts, trying to outdo one another. Um, you know, Elias was just relegated to introducing The Miz. You know, like, I, I don't get it. This guy proves himself in a match with Roman Reigns. And uh, just, you know, Elias has this whole look to him. You know, he, he even resembles the Macho Man to a point. And this is how they treat the guy. Just make him an introduction piece. I, what, what is this company doing? Seriously. Like, they have guys on here that are screaming to be stars. They're trying so hard, and they are trying to get themselves over. And they are succeeding at some level. As best as they can do with on their own with a shitty-ass creative team. And they still... Still can't find a spot for any of these guys that makes any sort of sense or can really truly get them to the next level. That's like nobody progresses. And it has to be said in 2018. It's reaching a point where it is getting ridiculous already. I don't understand. McMahon's talking about restarting the XFL. 
and we have a product that looks like this. I mean, if it's at this point, it is time to give up and it is time to give this company to somebody else and, and do something because how much longer is this supposed to continue? The, where, where WWE is basically a derelict, a I can't even say that word. It's a it's a ship just floating through space, and and you know it's no one's manning the controls. They're just going out into oblivion. It's, you know with no future in sight, no clear course set. They're just you know just barreling through space and time, and everything is just passing them opportunity after opportunity. Um, everybody is, is not getting over the way that they could. And it's it's really even not that hard. Like I said, you've got people writing things online that make better sense than the current storylines. You've got people with better ideas and videos. They might not be great. I might not 100% agree with them. But you have people doing podcasts with recommended storylines. And, and, and this is still still not enough. I'm begging WWE, steal some of that material for God's sakes. It's not copyrighted. Do it. Do something with this company that's worth the damn. Move your characters forward. Have a good show. Entertain us. Do characters. I mean, you know, how long are they going to stick to the same style? It's it's unsuccessful. They might be making money, but they could be making even more money, and they could be getting ratings. And despite what they say, oh, it's a new market, I've said it time and time again, ratings is still important. Otherwise, you wouldn't, ha you know, The Walking Dead would be a streaming show. It, it you know, would be a Netflix exclusive, it, it, you know, but instead they're, they're on cable television as well. And, and, and usually, you know, the best shows that they get the highest rings are not even on cable. But somehow The Walking Dead is getting 20 million people, 19 million people at watching their show. So if TV ratings, you know, don't matter, stop making excuses because your show is fucking garbage and people are DVRing it or they're watching it online. If people really wanted to see this show and it was that good, they wouldn't want to wait. They wouldn't want to DVR it. They would make sure like back in the day that they were on top of it. They were going to see this show as soon as it came on TV. They couldn't wait because they were so excited. Oh, I got to watch Raw. I got to see it. I, you know, I can't miss it. It's can't miss TV. They used to always say that, you know, you have to watch this show because you never know what's going to happen. Anything could happen. Remember Jim Ross used to even say anything could happen in the WWF. It was unpredictable. The, the show needed to be watched. It was just as good as any other popular show on TV, and even better. And somehow, some way, it became this show that's just a slow pace and a slow grind, and nothing's happening. And we're just having match after match with boring jobber after boring jobber, with no personalities, no characters, no nothing. There's there's no reason to watch this show. Uh, you know, you could take a break. I already proved it. Months ago, you could take a break from this show, not watch for six months, and you will see the same stuff, and you'll be caught up like that. There's nothing to follow here. There, You know, you couldn't do that with any other show. You'd be totally lost. You wouldn't know what was going on. You do that with Walking Dead, you won't know what's going on. You can't just all of a sudden stop watching the show and just, oh, I'll pick it up in a couple of months and not bother with the other episodes. With this show, there's no need to do that. You know, during the Attitude Era, it's like, you know, it's not like it would be hard to jump in, but, you know, you would be missing out on stuff. You'd hear the announcers and the characters on the show talking about things. You'd be like, oh, what was that all about? I want to see that. And then you would try to, you know, find out what went on. There's no interest like that. Nobody even cares when anything happens on this show because it's not exciting. It's not noteworthy. So how can you even... You know, watch this show. I always ask myself this. How can I even follow this show when there's no need to watch this show? There's no sense of urgency to watch this show. The show doesn't have anything going for it that really requires my viewing of the show. Anyway, um, so that's a rant for, I mean, I can make, you guys know, I could do 10, 20 other videos on this same topic, I could, you know, and I, I should probably save this. I, I, I should have more of a series 
on this Mike Moore individual videos, which I plan to do. 2018 is still young. Give me a chance, but there will be many rants to come on this in 2018 of, you know, but you guys already know, I've already done so many videos on improvements. It's almost like the videos will repeat themselves. I'm going to talk about basically the same things. I mean, I could talk about it in the now. I could talk about the current roster. The rosters are different, like I said. But, you know, every year I feel like I'm making the same type of videos. How WWE can improve, what they can do. And it always comes down to that. Characters, storylines, giving us a reason to watch, giving us a reason to tune in next week. But, you know, it, it, but it never comes to fruition. It's like, you know, these are basic problems for shows. What does a show have? Characters, storylines, cliffhangers. That's why people watch shows on TV. You got to have characters to be invested in. A storyline that holds your interest. And then you got to have a reason why you want to tune in next week. So what TV shows like to do is they implement something at the end of an episode called a cliffhanger. And if they don't have a cliffhanger, they're just good shows, such as like Law & Order, like SVU. They don't always have a cliffhanger. Sometimes the show just ends and they move on to the next story. But there's a reason to watch because the show is compelling throughout. There's there's mystery. You want to watch it to the end of the episode because you want to know what's going on. You want to see that crime solved. You want to see the case closed. And so that's why people watch Law & Order SVU. That's why they watch that show because there is a, 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 you know, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's like a book. It's like a story. You know, you want to read to the end of that book to find out the conclusion. With WWE, oh, there is a beginning, and oh, there is a middle, and there certainly is an end. But none of them are good, and none of them are compelling. But but let, let's move on already. So Cedric Alexander defeated Enzo by countout. I don't know if Enzo really injured his leg. I think it was probably just a heel tactic, but I'll give credit to Enzo. He made it look realistic. But what I want to talk about here is that kick from Cedric Alexander. This guy was kicking Enzo in the fucking face, uh, you know, like, like, like it was a like a punching bag. He, like he's in the kickboxing class and he's hitting the bag with his feet. Enzo's eye looked like a fucking tomato. I like burst open. It was bleeding profusely. I'm like, see, this is what happens when you kick people in the face as hard as you can and you kick them with all your might. This is what I talked about with Asuka, with Alexa Bliss and everything. What are they doing here? Stop kicking people as hard as you can trying to hurt them. This is supposed to be a fake form of entertainment. The, you know, it's it's like it's filming a movie. People don't try to kick each other as hard as they can. They don't try to smash people's face up. And I'm saying, look at Enzo's face. Just look at it after this match. And you can't tell me that they don't need to be a little bit safer in the ring. I mean, I would think that after 2015 with Seth Rollins and then again in 2016, they would have taken better precautions I mean, does anybody even realize that one of these indie stars, one of these big stars, these fan favorites from the YWC, that he actually end, helped end the career of one of the biggest stars of all time, Sting? And it's almost like people don't even care about this. I even hear what culture. They, they, they brought it up several times last year about Sting. I'm, I'm hearing wrestling with regret talking about, you know, the, the career of Sting, which was a good video, by the way. I do recommend Wrestling With Regret for those who are not aware. But, um, you know, they talk about the whole thing, but they, they don't want to condemn Seth Rollins for the whole situation. They don't want to condemn for the fact that his powerbomb injured Sting, and it also injured Finn Balor. And then you also have Kenta. You have uh, Hideo Idiocracy, again, busting up somebody's face. This is the second time in less than a month, in a matter of two, three weeks, where somebody's face is just completely destroyed and bleeding. And so, you know, like, they, they, they whited the whole thing out on YouTube, I see. And, and it's like, okay, now we have to address this. There's too many people getting their faces fucked up 
There's too many people getting injured here. Um, it, I mean, it's getting pretty fucking dangerous for, for a sport that had very few injuries back in the day. I mean, you really think about it. It, it was mostly wear and tear. Hogan's knee, Stone Cold's neck. You know, you had like Sky Duhati, Rhino with the neck fusion surgery. But that was wear and tear. That was, you know, after year after year of getting DDT and, you know, getting slammed on the, on your, on the back of your neck. That's, you know, it's wear and tear. It wasn't like one particular move that injured somebody. And, and like I said, but don't people think to about Draz, what happened to him back in 1999 on that day that would live in infamy? It's a day that's forgotten about, that nobody even talks about here in the YWC. But I believe I'm the only one who does, as a matter of fact. This was a guy that took a power bomb. Now, D'Lo Brown was a guy that, you know, he was a careful worker, never injured anybody, but they made a mistake, whatever it was, and Draz got dropped on his neck, and he got paralyzed. And, you know, he was paralyzed basically below his neck for, for a little bit of time. Now, thankfully, he regained everything above his waist. He can move again from there, but to this day, he is still in a wheelchair. And they don't want to talk about it. They did back in the day. They even talked about it. They even put him in the Don't Try it, This at Home videos. I mean, it was uh, it was a pretty big thing back in the day. And they had to really take a look at some of these things. And it was an honest-to-God accident. But you got to think back to that. Just like these guys are now even taking even more chances. And it's not even taking chances with the high-flying moves. You don't even see that as much. But the thing is, you know, people getting injured from them anyway. But it, it, it's more the fact that they're doing this stiff Japanese style and why I criticize it almost every single week here on this channel. Because it, it's not just, you know, me being paranoid. It, it, I, I'm seeing injury after injury. The turnbuckle bomb. Sting, the legend, the multi-time world champion. Injured. Then you have him injuring Finn Balor, who was a fan favorite at the time. Then you have, you know, Hideo Idiocracy bashing up Brian Kendrick's face. And now you have Enzo, where his eye looked like a fucking mess. Just for, from, and he did the same kick twice. And I noticed that he did it two times and he tried to kick him in the head as hard as he could. I, I mean, you know, why is nobody being held responsible? Why is nobody being talked to about this? Why are they not reprimanding these wrestlers for kicking people as hard as they can? Unless they're telling them to go out there and do it. I mean, I, I understand that's a gimmick for like Asuka and Naka Murphy, but now guys like Cedric Alexander are going to do it too. What are they telling them to go out there and, and, and just kick them as hard as you can? I thought it used to be take care of your opponent, carry them through the match, you know, uh, carry each other through the match, treat each other like friends, so you put together an entertaining performance, and then that's it. Now they're trying to make it like a real fight. It's not the UFC. It's not boxing. It's not a kickboxing tournament. It's nothing like that. So why are they continuing with this same style, even though people are getting hurt? Um... Kurt Angle was backstage. He did the tease with the, um, you know, with the women. And, you know, it, I, I don't know. With Trish Stratus, Lita, somebody, you know, I, I, I don't even know. Um, it's interesting. You know, they're going to have somebody. But like I said, they're going to have to have a lot of people coming into this rumble for the women. Because, I mean, they just, they don't have enough people. They just don't. Where are you going to find women besides NXT? But that's where they're going to go. They're going to dip into the NXT pool. Um, Miz wants his uh, match with Roman Reigns at, at Raw, the 25th anniversary of Raw. Okay, so we have our first match there. Um, th this should be a big show. But why do I have the feeling like... I remember when they did the 20th anniversary of Raw. Remember why that show was a joke? Uh, they didn't do anything for it. Okay, Raw 1000 was okay, but once again, it was a show that they could have done a lot better. 
And I feel like they're going to do the same thing here with, with the Raw 25. They're not going to do, they're not, they're not going to have a big super card like you think they are. I, I don't think that they're going to get a lot of it. This should be a show where Stone Cold and The Rock appear, but I, I wouldn't hold my breath is what I'm saying. Don't get too excited for this show. I don't see big things in the works. Uh, I'm hearing things. I read little things online, but I really wouldn't expect a whole lot from the show. They had the same rumors for, for, the, for the 20th anniversary of Raw, and a lot of people I remember back in 2013 were let down. I mean, that show was fucking horrendous. It, it, it was a bad show by regular Raw standards. Uh, but you could go back and even watch my old video of that, you know, when, when I did that five years ago. Um, you had Titus Worldwide defeating the bar. Uh, the only thing I was focused on here was Dana Brooke. That was about it, guys. Uh, Titus O'Neil. You know, this is a guy which I said is talented. He could go far. They could do something here with the whole worldwide gimmick. His charisma could bridge gaps for many stars. He could help people get over. And I'm pretty sure that that was the whole intended point of this group. But, man, I, I, I mean, they gave him the victory here, and it was just out of the clear blue sky. And the bar, it's like, you know, why do they have to demean these teams? Like, they're beaten by the team that that gets beat by everybody. So, you know, you you, you make them lose their tag titles, then they have to lose the title. I mean, like, really, what are they doing with this team? I, I don't even understand what they're even trying to plan out here, what they're trying to do. Uh, you know, you Every single time it seems like somebody loses a belt, they need to immediately get buried. They, or they have to move down the card right away. They, there's no way how they can still keep the team relevant or still make them seem strong. No, it's like, okay, you lost. Now we got to make a fool out of you. And I'm not really getting that whole uh, approach. And they've, they've done this now for years. Once again, they, they have some habits that they just seem like they're locked into. And they're not going to change. They're not going to do anything differently. They're going to keep on staying the course. Um, then you had backstage, and this is the part where I said they should have left this to the end. Um, well, first they, they do Paul Heyman in the ring with Brock Lesnar. I mean, my God, guys, again, it's the same promo. Again, Paul Heyman, it, Putting a different spin on it this time. Oh, no, this time it's not going to be Brock Lesnar stepping in at the Royal Rumble in a triple threat match. And, and who's saying, you know, who is he going to lose to? It, it's going to be, you know, who is Brock Lesnar going to pin? Okay, so we put a different spin on it. It's, it's the same, same thing. Paul Heyman on the right, Brock Lesnar on the left. And that's about it. Lesnar doesn't say a word. Heyman keeps, you know, just fucking running his mouth the same. And, and it's the same exact shit. It's the same exact line. The undisputed, defending, reigning champion. Okay, okay, enough already, Paul. The same fucking promo. I don't know if it's if, if this is him shooting from the hip. I don't know if it's scripted, but whatever it is, please spare us from the same exact lines. You keep saying the same thing week after goddamn week, and I am getting sick and tired of hearing the same thing already. It is time to move on from this style of promo. Let Brock talk already, or at least switch the shit up a bit. Do something different, or just don't do these promos at all. Switch formats. Do something to make it seem fresh. It is just the same fucking garbage, the same the same approach and, and and people praise it week after week we see Meltzer Keller everybody saying oh what a great promo by Paul Heyman what a good job he's done and it's like don't you guys realize you've been hearing the same promo now for five years already the, the same exact promo you've been hearing extensively and you're still praising that same promo it might have been good the first time. It might have been good the second time. It started getting old by the third time. 
But now we're up to like the 70th promo that sounds exactly the same way that it did with a few words switched around and you're still praising it? How do you have any credibility left? See, backstage, um, Strowman attacks Kane and, um, and, and Brock Lesnar. He takes a grappling hook and he pulls a steel structure down on top of him. And it was a cool moment. And that was like, oh, I was like, the show's over, right? Oh, wait a minute. There's still time left in the show. I, I'm like, they, they did a big moment like that. And then they went right back to the in-ring action. And this is what I was talking about the, at the beginning of the review. I'm like, how can they just, how can they just go right back to to, to in ring wrestling after a big moment like that? That that's like, you're like, holy shit! And then it's back to you know reverse chin locks and shit. You know, back in the ring. How how did they make that transition? What, like, but see, like once again, what goes through their heads? How did they think that was a good idea? What were they thinking once again? I have to say, what what goes through their minds when they put this show together, when they format this show? Like I said, with TV shows, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. This is like watching Law & Order SVU, and they solve the crime in the middle of the show as opposed to the end of it. Why would you continue to watch? You already saw the climax most people probably stop watching right there. So why is it any different when it comes to Raw? And the, the answer to that is there's none. This is called poor formatting. You you know what I'm saying? The show is already bad. It's already poor. But, you know, it, it could have at least been capped off with a good moment. And it also shows that they want to do their big moment in the middle of the show. And they consistently do this. And I, and I, and I think I'm starting to understand exactly why. Because people are not going to watch all the way to the end because they keep on having decreased viewership in the third hour. So instead of doing the smart thing and I oh, I don't know, maybe improve the fucking show, maybe, maybe, it's a little suggestion there, maybe make the show just a, a little bit better because it, it is pretty horrible. No, in, instead, we're just going to move our best thing to the middle of the show and then go back to just making the rest of the show really shitty. What I mean, it, this is probably one of the the most asked backwards methods I think I've ever seen from a show. It really is. I mean, what what can be gained from having a format like this? Okay, so you showed us something good. And then, okay, so people are just going to turn the TV off then after that. Why even bother with the third hour? So And then why even have a third hour? Now, a lot of people say that Raw would be a lot better if it was two hours. Okay, but then again, look at SmackDown. It's not a lot better, right? It's not a lot better w w with two hours. It wouldn't even be better with one hour, guys. It's the fact that you just need to write a consistently entertaining show. It has nothing to do with the length of time. It, okay, it is a bit long, three hours. But I will say it's like it has more to do with just the entertainment value. Nitro was three hours. Was it a bit long? Oh, hell yeah. But the thing is, you know, it was entertaining. Uh, there was more to watch, more to look forward to on that show. It was more eventful. And, you know, they were eventful here. They did something good with, with all three guys headed in. But once again, it, it's also the world title picture in the middle of the show or towards the end, you know, with still an hour left, maybe not in the exact middle. Um... So Samoa Joe defeated Rhino. I thought this was an opportunity that, you know, if we're going to have wrestling matches, we could have had a nice, good match here. But, you know, once again, treat Rhino as the jobber. And, and I, I don't understand it. Rhino looks 10 times tougher than Joe. I would love to see Rhino take the place of Samoa Joe. Uh, now, I guess because Samoa Joe has all the years and Ring of Honor and shit, people like Samoa Joe better. And because, once again, Samoa Joe, just like Paul Heyman, has been cutting the same promo for over a decade, you know, this is this is better. But I think Rhino has a better look. I think he's a bit more believable than Joe. Joe sounds like a fucking cartoon character half the time. And listen to his promo after the match. This was like a short match, 
And this guy was sweating profusely. Now, I understand you could say these are bright lights, but nobody else th does that. I've seen guys wrestle their asses off for, for 20 minutes, and, 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 and like they hardly break a sweat. Samoa Joe looked like he had wrestled an Iron Man match five times over. That fat bastard was sweating up a fucking storm. I mean, he looked like a goddamn fucking pig. And he was out of breath. He could barely get his promo out. I mean, man, this guy was winded after like a five-minute fucking match. I mean, that's that's pretty pathetic. And it goes to what I, I, I say every single week about this guy. He's too damn fat. He's a fat fuck. And he, they need to get this guy in shape or ship him out already. I mean... That how does this look? This guy, you know, he's heaving and hoeing, and every single time he exhales, you you see the 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 blubber just jiggling around on that fatty. I mean, and people want to put this guy over. Give me a break, okay? So what are we talking about here? So, um, the 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 weird female interviewer Charlie, who's always like, you know, always very strange. This girl and. She starts running through the uh, the opponents that Samoa Joe is going to face in the Royal Rumble. He announced he was going to be in the Royal Rumble. Um, and he stops. He says, John Cena. He says he's going to go after John Cena and he's going to eliminate him first. Uh, so apparently here, I guess this kind of confirms that we're going to have Joe and Cena at, at, at Mania. I, I'm sorry, but I mean, it's interesting. I sort of want to see that feud and match, but I mean, I, I don't know. They put so much stock into this Samoa Joe, it, m mostly the, the, the fans on the internet. And I said, I've never seen it in Joe. I just, I don't see that it factor. I see a guy that he tries. He does. He, he puts it in after. I can't take that away from him. Joe knows what he's doing. You know, uh, he, he's decent enough in the ring, but there's just something about Joe I can't get behind this guy. And then part is that lame-ass character he has, that super serious, monotone, um, you know, tough guy act that he's been doing for years, not switching it up. And, of course, the terrible tights. I, I mean, I don't, you know, and, and just the fact that he looks like a fucking slob, for God fucking sakes, I mean... I can't stress it enough. This guy looked like he was about to die during this promo. He was so fucking out of breath. I, I mean, there was enough sweat filling that you could have filled up a fucking water pitcher. You could have filled up the goddamn Atlantic Ocean with the amount of sweat that this this fat whale was. I mean, my God. Can you imagine being in a room? You know what's a good punishment for a criminal? Have Samoa Joe and Kevin Owens both wrestle each other in a, a two-hour Iron Man match. Then stick that criminal in the room, you know, with no windows, no ventilation, just a solid fucking concrete room. And that person would suffer. Could you imagine the stench of those two fatties in the room after all that perspiration and shit? I mean, my God, I mean, that would be a fitting punishment for any criminal. I mean, bring them down to Guantanamo Bay, torture some prisoners with that fucking stench. I mean, I'm looking at this guy and I'm like, can you imagine Charlie's nostrils must have been gone? It must have been flaring up and probably, I don't know, she might have had some nasal damage probably from standing next to that smelly fatty. I mean... I, I mean, it, it's pretty pathetic. Uh, you know, we had uh, Alexa Bliss lying to Nia Jax, saying that Asuka, the female Naka Murphy, said something nasty about her. Um, then Asuka came out for a match. Nia Jax attacked her from behind. She did two moves. It wasn't much of a beatdown, and then she just walks away, and we don't have the match up. Oh. I can't begin to tell you how many times. So, Nia Jax does two moves before the, the, the bell that she's done all the time during matches, and suddenly Asuka's too hurt to wrestle. I, I, I don't, I'm don't. i not getting that. Um, I don't see the logic there. Uh, 
Very exciting stuff, though, building up towards this Royal Rumble, huh, guys? Right? Stimulating stuff. Then in the main event, it was the Balor Club defeating Roman, Seth, and Jason Jordan. Okie dokie. So, there you go. There you go, guys. I, I, I mean, <laughs> if you were worried about your beloved fuckboy getting beat by Kane, Oh, Balor is buried. Oh, Balor is facing the Miz Taraj. He's being buried on the car. Well, there you go. As the Balor Club actually beat the team of... Now, they didn't pin Roman. I think they pinned Seth. But even still, I'm like, why are they making these guys so prominent? Why do they think that these guys... Now they're going to take over the WWE? I mean, it was supposed to be... The Shield, and I don't know, you know, a lot of shit happened. Roman got sick. Now Ambrose is injured. They've got Jason Jordan in there. But, you know, seriously, like, this, and this is the most entertaining thing that they could put on to close the show. Not the, you know, the world title thing. No, let, let's put that in the middle of the show. This is going to be your main event. I'm sorry, but I do not buy the Balor Club as main event material. Especially when you just told me a few weeks ago that Balor is a schlub, that he doesn't matter. And I was agreeing with them. I says, hell, the guy doesn't even deserve to be in the fucking company. You, you, you won't get any argument out of me. You guys know how I feel about Balor. But, you know, once again, we're, uh, we're going to throw him out there. And, and we're going to make an even bigger deal out of him. It's almost like... Like McMahon or somebody felt bad. Oh, we need to give him another chance. That wasn't right what we did to him. No, it, it's, it was time to move on to somebody else. It was getting a bit ridiculous. Now all of a sudden, Balor is a tough guy. We have to listen to him with his stupid, annoying accent. And, you know, th this guy is the very definition of subpar. I, I, I mean, really, I, this is... This is not a high cal caliber talent. It doesn't matter if you change his. Like I said, you know, he can wear the paint and shit, but he's still Balor underneath. And that's how it is. It doesn't matter. Some people don't have the it factor. I, I, I mean, like I said, at least I could say good things about Samoa Joe. I could come up with positives. I can't come up with anything good for Balor. I'm sorry, but there, there's nothing that I could say to praise this guy. I try, you know, you guys know that I will look up and down to find positives in this show because I want to find positives in this show. It gets very tiresome having to drag every single show through the fucking mud week after week. But then again, you know, they seem to always surprise me. They always seem to come up w w with a new wrestler that just has no business being here. And that guy has been Balor for the past couple of years. Uh, and like I said, they had the right idea jobbing him out to Kane by establishing this is this is not the next big thing. This guy's not going to be a big star. After the, that whole fiasco with, you know, oh, it was going to be Lesnar and Bauer in a dream match. And I was, I was telling you guys that this match doesn't deserve to happen. I said I wouldn't be surprised if it did happen. It wasn't going to happen. Now I'm not so sure anymore. It's like almost like they're giving him a second chance. I don't know, guys. I, I, I don't know. But this is not how you end the show. If they ended it with Braun Strowman in that segment, I would have said it was a bad show. But at least they ended it well. Now all I could say is that we had a shitty main event with a guy that has no business being in any main event whatsoever. We had a good segment in the middle of the show, but but that was it. I mean, that was basically it, guys. There's nothing more that I could say about this show that's positive. Throughout the show, they were also showing clips of the Mixed Match Challenge. Do I even really need to comment on this as we're seeing wrestlers getting out of character? Did we really see online we saw Braun Strowman hugging Alexa Bliss? We're seeing The Miz and Asuka teaming together. And The Miz saying he's happy to be teaming with babyface Asuka. 
Good God Almighty. I, I mean, 2018 is already shaping up to be one shitty-ass wrestling year. Uh, anyway, guys, God help us. It's been your YWC champ, signing out.